on a regular basis. It seems that I come across the stupid debate between science versus religion. And I call it stupi stupid. Be not because I'm an ordained minister or I'm convinced the superiority of faith. No, it's, it's just that both are completely different topics that do not contradict one another. For me, those arguments makes as much sense as comparing uh, cooking and watching a movie. Yes, both can be done by human beings and maybe after watching a good Italian me movie we feel like eating a delicious spaghetti. Okay. However, these two activities are these two activities have a different function and answer different needs. It is the same with science and religion. They begin with different questions and they try to provide different answers. For example, one of the main questions for science is how. How did life appear on Earth? How can I build uh, better planes? How does this computer or this tablet work? Faith for its part often begins with why. Why does evil exist in our world? Why are we called to live an honorable life? Why should we help one another during a pandemic? But unfortunately, too many Christians these days still cannot see the difference between both. And you surely saw on the news all those religious people who rejected the advice of health uh, authorities and defied the orders of confi on confinement to go to church on Easter. There was this woman who told the CNN reporter that she was not worried to catch the COVID-19 or to give it to others because she was cover with the blood of Christ and it was this evangelical minister from Virginia who vowed to keep preaching in his church and ask people and well invite people said to people basically not to respect social distancing well guess what he died a few days ago from the corona virus now it seems that for some Christians believing in God and following the words in the Bible must trump everything else, even science and uh, good old common sense. Any compromise, question, or doubt is seen as a sign of weakness or lack of faith. And this morning text from the Gospel according to John chapter 20 verses 19 to 31 is often used to reinforce this mindset. Thomas, a disciple of Jesus since the beginning, is, this, it is depicted here as a doubter. And since then, he has been criticized because he refused to accept the good news of the resurrection immediately. And he has even become the icon the icon, sorry, of everyone who is skeptical, stubborn, and even a bit cynical. All of this began one evening when the disciples were meeting behind the locked door of a house. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Jesus came and stood among them. He showed his disciple his hands and his side, proving that he was the one who was crucified. And after this, well, the disciple rejoiced and start to believe in the unbelievable. God has raised Jesus from the dead. But unfortunately for him, Thomas was absent that night. And when he came back, I'm sure the disciple rushed on him and told him the story with great excitement. You know what, Thomas? Jesus showed up a few hours ago. Yes, the Master was here. 
and he looked pretty good for a guy who was crucified, you know? So we gave him something to eat, we got, we talked about the good old times, it was amazing! Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, probably replied Thomas, and if we want to be honest, the disciples' allegation was hard to believe. So Thomas desired a little more than a pseudo eyewitness report. He, want, he wanted hard evidence. And he said, unless I see in his hands the prints of the nails and place my finger in the marks of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will not believe you. Like I said, many blame Thomas for his absolute and non-negotiable terms to accept Christ's resurrection. And why did he ask for personal and direct access to believe? We're not quite sure. We don't know. Maybe he wanted to experience the presence of the risen Christ like the other disciples already did before. Maybe he was a practical, no-nonsense man who needed tangible evidence to understand something. Maybe he desired to see it in order to believe it. And 2,000 years later, can we really say that we are that different from Thomas? How many times have we wondered how this resurrection thing really worked? Because even with the limited knowledge of biochemistry, we know that it's highly improbable that someone declared dead for three days can come back to life. And since we are sure that there were no defibrillators or life support system in ancient times, well, we want to look for an explanation because we live in a society and in a time that need concrete evidence for all claim, claims of truth. We need to find logical and scientifically possible, plausible explanation. So we say, oh, maybe Jesus has a twin, like in a good soap opera. Or, or the man that showed up that night was an impersonator. Or, or maybe this was some kind of hoax perpetrated on the disciples. Like, Jesus did not really die on the cross. He was only unconscious, mostly due to the sore wine he received. And after a few hours in the tomb, he recovered and then reappeared to his follower full of life and energy. Ah, yes, all sort of theories have been presented across the ages. However, as New Testament professor Ulrich Wilkins affirms, it's impossible to prove the resurrection scientifically. He, think, he thinks all naturalistic explanations are refuted. He says how the grave of Jesus become empty is a question that cannot be answered in an hysterical way. So a week later, the disciple gathered again, and this time Thomas was present. Once more, Jesus appeared among them, even if the doors were locked. Then Jesus accepted Thomas' challenge and invited him to, pr to proceed with his uh, little test. Jesus wants to show his disciple that there were no tricks. It was really him standing in front of them. Well, Thomas did not have to perform any conclusive and successful scientific experiment to understand what was happening. He rather made the most profound affirmation of faith we can find in all the Gospels. He declares, My Lord and my God. Thomas acknowledged that he was in the presence of Jesus, the risen Christ.
for all the wrong reasons, we have convinced ourselves that a person cannot doubt and still be a good Christian. Doubt, but doubt and question are an essential part of our human nature. Without them, many great discoveries our, of our world would not have been made. Without them, we would accept all the information and the propaganda from governments and big corporations. Without them, we would remain the same forever. By doubting, Thomas embarked on a faith journey that no other disciple made before him. His doubt was the starting point that led him to discover the profound relationship between Jesus and God. His old master was more than a great teacher. He was and still is the long-awaited Messiah, the one who gave meaning to our existences. And Thomas teach us that it, it is through doubting that our faith can grow. It is only when we are ready to leave our zones of comfort, our preconception, our uncertainties, in order to enter an unsettling journey full of questions, that we can develop a new and deeper understanding of the ways to be God's people. So if you ask me what exactly happened in the tomb between Good Friday and Easter morning, or if the resurrection is an accurate historical event, my most honest answer would be, I don't know. And up to a certain point, I don't really care. No, we're encouraged to believe that somehow death does not have the last word, last word in this world. We're asked to believe that hope is still possible despite all the evidence to the contrary. We are invited to believe that new life can emerge from what appears to be lifeless. We are called to believe that the first disciple really experienced the presence of the risen Christ like many still do today. And we can all do all of this because accepting Christ's resurrection has nothing to do with science. It's all about faith. And for this, thanks be to God. And Amen.